Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Before I begin to preach, I want to just share a little bit about a conversation that's gone on uh, this week. Um, in, in Bethlehem, the uh, Orthodox Church there has um, made a decision that until there's peace in uh, Bethlehem and in Israel and Gaza, um, they're not going to light the lights of the of the um, the square there. So if you ever go to Bethlehem during the Christmas season, it's full of lights. They've lit up the whole place because this is a great you know there's a great pilgrimage to uh, Bethlehem during the Christmas season. The the church in Jerusalem has uh, chosen to participate as well. And uh, so the British Methodist Church reached out to us and uh, actually through someone who knows about it um, and saying that the British Methodist Church has chosen not to light the candle of peace during the Advent season to go ahead and do the rituals but not light the candle uh, as a way until there's peace in, in uh, Israel and Gaza. And we talked about it, and it, uh, very frankly, it didn't really make a lot of sense to us uh, in the sense that more than ever, we want to be praying for peace, right? And so we believe that by lighting the candle, it is our way of praying for that peace to come in. And, and but, but here's what I wanted to just challenge us about. Sometimes we do this in a way that's very perfunctory. We say, oh, yeah, we're going to pray for peace peace. Yeah, we're going to pray for love to come where we, you know, as we go through the Advent season. I just want to challenge us each week that as we think about it every day, that we really understand the lighting of this as a way of fervently praying for peace to come, not just in Israel and Gaza, of course. I mean, we've talked about Ukraine, read in the, in the, uh, um, on the internet today that there's 32 places in the world that are engaged in war of some sort or another which is just uh, horrific if we think about it. So um, I just I, I share this with you just because um, we, we didn't want to just sort of smile our way through all this, but to recognize what's going on in the world around us and be very fervent and perseverant in our prayers that peace indeed will come. All right, let's, uh, let's pray together. Oh, God, open us up today. Open our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. So, um, my my wife is out of town uh, this weekend. She, my daughter, turned turns forty this week. One of my daughters, and so the sisters and my wife all went on a little girls' weekend. Um, and here's the thing. <clears throat> um, my wife is extremely neat and orderly and clean. I am not. Uh, that's the best way I can say it. I don't know what happened in my growing up, but I am rather a slob. And um, so what happens is um, it is amazing to me how quickly I can mess up a house. I mean, in like two days, there's stuff everywhere. I've got dishes in the, you know, on the counter and on the coffee table and uh, everything. stuff is on the floor. And I'm like, how did I do this so quickly? This is ridiculous. But she's coming home today. <laughs> so it is time for Operation The Queen Returns, right? I remember, Ever since our kids were small, we had Operation Mom Comes Home anytime she was gone. You had to put it back together as best you could. You couldn't always remember exactly where everything is supposed to be, even after a day or two, but you're going to do it. Operation The King Returns is what Advent is about. Operation The King is Coming. And we want to be ready. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. Lift up the low places. Right? We, we need to be ready for Christmas. Not just our houses and stuff, but our hearts, our minds, our lives. We need to be, they need to be put right. Now, what the scripture tells us is that there is an advanced man coming. I don't know if uh, Spencer Geisinger, I got really ex interested in Spencer Geisinger this week. He was in charge of the advance office for uh, both of the Bush presidencies. And this is, this is really cool. Uh, um, an advance, the presidential advance office, the White House advance office, has six staffers, 
plus the, uh, plus the uh, head of it, and but 200 volunteers. And so every time the president goes somewhere, there'll be a couple of staff people, but then they'll take with them like 10 or 12 volunteers. And you get to you get to stay in the hotels, and you get a free trip, and you participate, you get trained, you get security clearance, all that stuff, and then you get to help make things ready for the president. Someday when I retire, I'm going to sign up to be a, a, a an advanced person volunteer. How fun would that be? They talked all about what it was like to do the advanced work for uh, the Beijing Olympics in, 20, in 2008 and how hard that was because the, the Chinese government wouldn't let them do stuff, but they did it anyway. And how, I, I just thought, how fun is that? So here's what the scripture says to us. Listen. It says... See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, an advance man. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So um, Malachi writes in the 4th century B.C., just after the exile, some people believe that, so the word Malachi actually means my messenger. So it may be that's not his name, right? It, it may be that this is Ezra writing as a messenger. We don't really know um, who, who um, Malachi is. But what he's saying is, look, we come back to Jerusalem after the exile. We've been set free from Babylon and returned to Jerusalem, uh, to Jerusalem um, but we don't have our act together. And the, and the Messiah is going to come. We need to get our act together before the Messiah comes. And the messenger that he's proclaiming is Elijah. They believe that Elijah would come before uh, Moses taught that Elijah would come before the Messiah came. As Christians, we believe that to be John the Baptist who, who came before uh, Jesus. But uh, he's saying this one, Elijah, what Malachi is saying, Elijah is going to come and is going to prepare us. Now, um, he goes on to say, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? So th there, we have a colloquial term for this. We call that a come to Jesus meeting, right? Have you ever had a come to Jesus meeting, maybe with your family? We've got to have a come to Jesus meeting, people. Or maybe with yourself, you're looking in the mirror. I need a come to Jesus meeting. Well, this is a variation of that. This is a Jesus is coming meeting. We're having a Jesus is coming meeting, and we're going to figure out what needs to be done. And it may not be pleasant. Come to Jesus meeting seldom are, right? It's hard work. We have to really take a hard look at our lives and see how our priorities have gotten all messed up. How we've got the wrong things uh, as most important and the, the right things as least important. It's time to have one of those meetings. So he goes on. He uses these two very interesting images. For he is like a refiner's fire and like washer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. So uh, here's what a refiner, how refiner works. They uh, heat metals to like 2,000 degrees or something. It's a process called cupulation. It's interesting. They still use the, basically the same process today. And um, it, it burns off the impurities, the other ores that are in there, the other metals that are in the ore, and, what, and leave the pure silver or the pure gold. I, one of the things I love is that the refiners um, would say that how do you know when the silver is ready? It's when you can look and see yourself in it like it's a mirror. I've often thought that God looks and says, how will I know when you're done being refined? When I can look and see myself in you, God says. I always thought that was kind of a powerful picture. So the, the sense of refining is to burn off the stuff that doesn't matter, burn off the stuff that's not important, so we can take hold of the stuff that is important, the stuff that is really valuable. That's what a refiner does. 
the launderer's soap is, they would take cloth and um, they'd take it outside the city because they'd use this, this soap uh, made of mostly of lye and it smelled terrible. And so they didn't ever do it in the city. They called it fuller's soap is another word for it. If you ever go to Jerusalem, they may take you to a place they call the fuller's field outside the city. Um, we don't really know where it was, but it's mentioned in Isaiah, and so they've created a place to help you kind of know what it's like. But they would take cloth, and they would put these harsh chemicals on it and beat it with paddles and to get rid of all of the impurities in it and make it pure white. And then they could dye it to be a color, or they could leave it as white. But you wouldn't ever go through a dyeing process or turning it into clothes until it had gone through the fuller's process, the eliminating of the impurities, the getting rid of the stuff that doesn't matter. So what's that mean for us? How do we refine our lives and get rid of the things that don't matter so we can take hold of the things that are important, the really good stuff? I was um, recently reading, uh, again, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. You may be familiar with it. It's a classic in the business world. It's about how businesses go from good to great. And part of it is what he calls the hedgehog concept. This has always taken hold of me. It's based on, uh, he says that what you really need to focus your time and energy on is the one place where your, where your passion, the things you're passionate about, the things you're good at, and what is your resource engine? What drives your resource engine? Where those three things overlap is the thing you need to spend your energy and time and money on. And so um, he, he uses this term. It's called the hedgehog concept because he says the fox knows many things. This is a Greek uh, legend. Uh, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows only one thing. So the idea is that the fox will do all sorts of things to try and get the hedgehog, will try and you know, sneak up on it, will lay dead so it'll come to him, it'll do all these clever things. Foxes are very clever and wily, but the hedgehog is not so clever and wily. All the hedgehog does is it has one thing, and that is these little porcupine spines all over it, and so it curls up. That's its only defense mechanism. It can't run, can't hide, can't do anything. All it can do is that one big thing. So he says, foxes have many thing, know many things, a hedgehog knows only one big thing. What is the one big thing that you need to make most important? Like what's the essence of your life, of the Christian life? What's that one big driving principle? Well, as Christians, we know this. Teacher from Matthew 22. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, okay, we have two big things. But to what extent is the rest of your life organized around those? To, to what extent are you putting aside anything that doesn't support those things? Anything that doesn't uh, uh, emphasize loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Everything else to be refined away. Now, there's two, two ways I think that happens. Sometimes you have to eliminate some things, right? So th there are things you say, you know, I just can't, I've got to put that away. That, that might be resentments that you just can't seem to let go of. Anger that just seems to drive you. Guilt that is overwhelming and it just keeps you from being in the business of loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Might be issues of your lifestyle. Might be an addiction. Uh, all, it, it, it might be your spending policies, how you spend your money. I was listening to a pastor preach recently who was sharing that I, I thought it was very vulnerable of him, sharing that he and his wife had gotten deep, deeply into credit card debt. And they weren't sure how they were going to get out, but he knew that they had to change their way of life. So he did a program called Lazarus at Your Gate. It's a, it's a Bible study program and a life change program, kind of like Financial Peace University, but uh, it's a little different. 
And it, the idea is how do I change from, from the satisfaction I get from getting something to the satisfaction I get to about giving something? That the giving away is where I'm going to get my satisfaction as opposed to the getting. And so that's what Lazarus at your gate is all about. I just thought, well, what, an, what an interesting way of thinking. I need to get my priority right. I need to put things in order, and, and I'm going to have to change my lifestyle. So maybe it's about this, this refiner's fire is about eliminating some of those things. But there's another way of looking at it, too, and that is this one big thing is also how we see all the little things. How, they are organized around the big thing, but they support it. So uh, last week, I had the opportunity to visit with my good friend Clayton Oliphant. Clayton is the pastor at First Methodist Church, First United Methodist Church of Richardson. We've been friends a long time. His dad, Bishop Ben Oliphant, was our bishop here when I was the youth pastor. And then when he retired, he became a part of St. Luke's, and I had the privilege of doing his memorial service. Um, So one day during the Advent season, I'm sitting with Bishop Oliphant at a breakfast. And I said, so Bishop, what are you doing during the Advent season? You know, how are you getting ready for Christmas? And he said, you'll know how long ago this was. He said, I'm looking for a Wii. You remember the Wiis, the WII little uh, gaming consoles? And apparently that year, they were very, very, Clayton reminded me of this story, uh, very, very um, hard to find. And he said, I'm gonna, my, my son in Dallas, Clayton, uh, is trying to find one for his kids, and, I can't, and he can't find one in Dallas, but I'm going to find one here in Houston. And he said, and so I've gone to all these stores, and one store they told me that they have a truck coming in tomorrow, and there's going to be 12 on it. And so I'm going to get there at 4 o'clock in the morning and wait so that when the truck gets there, I get one of these wheeze. And I said, really, what store? And he said, I'm not going to tell you what store that is, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. He said, I'm not telling you. I'm no fool. And, and I said, so are you telling me that a Wii, a, a dumb gaming console, is, is worth getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning for? And he said, no, it's not. But my grandkids are. My grandkids are worth it, me getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning. You see, you have to understand what is the point of what you're doing. And sometimes, especially during the Christmas season, we get in this sense where there's all this stuff we've got to do. And it's, it's all about, uh, uh, about loving our neighbor, and it's all about celebrating the coming of Jesus, but I don't think about that at all. All I think about is getting all my stuff done and all of these check marks on my list and How can we begin to understand and keep our minds focused on what is really essential, the essence? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. How how are the, the pieces of my life supporting that? All right, so there's one more thing that he says. The the passage goes on and says, I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers in their wages, the widow, the orphan, against those who thrust aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. What is he saying is if if you really, how, how will we know if we're focused on the things that really matter. Well, there's, there will be substantive changes in our lives th- that we will actually begin to live as Jesus taught us to live. And I want you to notice that in this passage, there are things that are about personal holiness, right? You don't lie, you don't commit adultery, you don't, those things. But then they're also about social holiness. I'm not going to oppress others. I'm, you know, I'm going to give workers their wages, all those sorts of things. So, Is there a sense in your life that the the substance of your life is demonstrating the essence that's so important? Here's how he closes. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. (laughs) 
Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Um, You may say to me, Pastor, I've heard sermons like this before and they have really convicted me. I've read, I've I've had moments in my life where I, I got so clear that my my priorities were all messed up and I had the wrong first things first and um, I was reading a a Bible verse the other day and it it really spoke to my heart and I I decided I was going to get my myself together but but I didn't so pastor I'm kind of jaded and I'm kind of cynical that I I don't really think anything is going to change here's what he says I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you haven't perished. Meaning, I'm, I'm going to keep loving you. Even if you don't change, I'm not going to destroy you. I, I, I love you anyway. If you ever had toddlers, when your toddler begins to throw a temper tantrum, you put the toddler over in the corner and you say, just go ahead and when you're done, we'll talk about this. I think that's what God is saying to us. Look, when you're ready, when you're ready, I'll be here. When, when you're ready to make the changes, I, I, I'm going to love you anyway, but when you're ready to make the changes, just come to me. You know, um, when Dee gets home, uh, it's not going to be perfect, but she'll know I tried. Let's pray. Gracious God, we're so grateful, so grateful for um, your love for us. And when we take a hard look at our lives, when we look in the mirror, when we look at our relationships, when we look at how we spend our time and our money, our energy, we see that we don't have it just right. And we pray, God, that this Advent season, as we're preparing for your coming, we would put first things first. We would be that hedgehog that has that one, that one big principle to love you and our neighbors with all our hearts. So convict us, God, and then by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to do that refinement to which you call us. In the name of Christ, amen.